This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of June 1st, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Dukes Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, now that we know the candidates, our first reaction to the upcoming election cycle. Second, oil prices are back to where they were in mid-March. What does that mean for Alaska? And third, why a recent report from Moody's indicates that Alaska state government isn't suffering financially from COVID. And now, let's join Michael. The first thing we want to jump into is your first take on the candidates' filings from yesterday. Um, it was down to the wire for a couple of them, but uh, what are what are your thoughts uh, as far as uh, the candidates that came out? What are the standouts for you? Well, I'm still going through the list. Um, for those who, who for those who want to get into the detail, detail James Brooks has an excellent spreadsheet. No surprise for me, but an excellent spreadsheet. Uh, where he's got all the candidates listed, color-coded by party, and the start of their um, the start of their financial situation, uh, which is going to be a great uh, a great thing to follow uh, through the course of the election. I think um, there's a couple of surprises uh, that I think are are notable. Um, not necessarily that they're you know that they make or break the legislature, but just because they're surprises. Andy Holloman's uh, uh, filing as an independent uh, or a, a, a petition candidate uh, in the Senate race against uh, uh, Josh Revac, I think, is a surprise. I didn't, I didn't anticipate that, and I think that changes the dynamics uh, of that election cycle. Andy is uh, uh, has been on the school board, has uh, has developed some profile from that. Uh, is a Republican, uh, always surprises people, but is a Republican, uh, and uh, although he may have changed it for this run, but um, is a Republican and um, uh, has not been an extremist uh, in terms of uh, in terms of his fiscal positions uh, in the past. Um, so that's one that's a surprise. Jeff Landfield's the, the entertainment value alone of this one. Uh, is going to be interesting. Jeff Landfield's uh, run uh, filing uh, against Natasha von Imhoff uh, for the for the her Senate district seat. Again, uh, Landfield running as a petition candidate to go straight to the general election, uh, not uh, deal with the uh, not deal with the uh, primary, is is another uh, I think uh, uh, interesting run. Uh, Ross Bylings. Uh, 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 Conversion, it looks like, to a petition candidate in House District 28. At least that's the way I'm reading the chart right now. Uh, against Jennifer Johnston, will will make the dynamics of of that race interesting. Um, James uh, Kaufman is running against her in the primary. Ross had been in that primary, uh, but looks like, at least uh, according to uh, James's chart, uh, converted to a uh, petition candidate. Uh, and there's also Democrat in that race, so that so if Ross stays in as a as an end of, as a petition candidate, that uh, that's going to change the dynamics of that general election. Usually, that's been fought out in the uh, in the in the uh, primary. House District 30, uh, you've got Knopp, uh, Ron Gillum, and Kelly Wolf. Uh, obviously, I have a favorite in that race, um, but uh, 
it, it, they both stayed in. I, I had sort of anticipated one of them dropping out uh, to have a one-on-one -on -one against Kanat, but then there's another uh, another candidate that comes in, at the, another petition candidate that will come in uh, in that race as well. So there's there's some surprises I think uh, that uh, that showed up yesterday that people weren't expecting that it's going to make uh, at least that I wasn't expecting that it's going to make this uh, this election cycle a lot more interesting than than it would have been before. Well, and I think it's interesting to watch. I too was wondering in some of these races, and I will say historically it has been the the one thing that um, Democrats have been very good at have been uh, the ability to. Um, uh, has been the one of the things the Democrats have always been good at has the, been the ability to uh, come together and only put up a single candidate. And Republicans seem to very consistently um, put up multiple candidates into the same into the same primary, thereby splitting splitting and watering down the vote, which I find uh, which I find very very interesting. Um, but, you know, and I was hoping, like you said, in that one race uh, in the Soldatna area with uh, Ron Gillum and Kelly Wolf, that you know maybe the candidates could come together and they could kind of take a look at it and they could, uh, uh, you know, they could you know come to a consensus as to only one of them running uh, against it because the only person that really benefits in those kind of situations usually is the is the incumbent. The incumbent is the only one that that ends up. Uh, fighting back on that. So this should be a, a very interesting race. One of the big ones, of course, is House District 27 with Lance Pruitt, who filed at the very last minute, um, has not had a chance to really raise any money. And Liz Snyder, who went up against him, uh, they had a very close race. Uh, it, you know, he's very cl close in the last time that, that Lance ran. Uh, and she's got a war chest. I mean, she's got something like eighty thousand dollars in her war chest. Um, so he's got some. He's got some catching up to do. Yep. Yep. She has eighty-seven thousand, according to according to James's chart here. Yeah. So it's a little it's a little worrying as far as that goes. So I think I think the next level of analysis, and I haven't I haven't gotten this far yet, but I think the next level of analysis is is what are the key what what are going to be the key seats, um, and and what are going to flip the flip the legislature from uh, more conservative to to less conservative, and I think there's a few of those out there that you can identify uh, already. Um, uh, the Kevin McKinley's run against Adam Wool in House District Five, uh, I think, is going to be uh, a key one. That uh, district has has gone back and forth between Republicans and Democrats over the over the years. Uh, if you look at the financials that at least James has got on his chart, uh, Kevin is in much better financial situation than Adam uh, right now. Uh, and um, and that'll be a that'll be an interesting an interesting race. And I think uh, a key race to to help uh, flip the uh, flip the House over. Another one, obviously, is going to be the, the race against Kerry Knopp. Uh, in House District 30, um, and whether uh, uh, people are able to, uh, to, to, whether either Gillum or Wolf are able to flip that race. Um, the financials that people are reporting right now have Knopp out ahead, but hopefully there will be some support that uh, that uh, uh, develops around, uh, in my case, develops around Ron Gillum to, to make that run. So I think there's a there's a few, uh, the, the race against uh, uh, Chuck Kopp, Tom McKay's run against Chuck Kopp is going to be uh, is going to be another uh, I think uh, key race. Uh, Kopp's got something of a bankroll, although not as significant as you might think. Uh, McKay hasn't reported his financials yet, um, so there's there's some potential there. So I, I think there's I think you can I, I think we're going to be able to as we go along identify two or three or four house races that are going to be key. Uh, in, uh, in 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 determining the outcome uh, of uh, of the house uh, house structure, uh, I think one of the more interesting races for me personally is House District 34 in Juneau, with Andy Story being uh, being challenged by economist and friend of the show Ed King. Um, he, I saw he had a post yesterday. He's still looking for a few final um, signatures on his petition, election petition to get it into the LIO 
uh, but he's in. I mean, he's he's running it, and and he's running as an independent, which I think is is not a bad thing. Um, because of his his fiscal acumen and and kind of his whole uh, you know stance philosophically on budgets and stuff like that, uh, that would be an interesting that would be an interesting flip. And I don't know if he can do it or not. Um, I'm hoping so. As an independent, he has a better chance in Juno than as a Republican. Um, any thoughts on that race? Yeah, I think Ev's going to run a good race. I mean, he hasn't. Uh, he, he, that that race is going to be getting out and, and pounding the pavement and, and COVID has, has obviously had uh, some limitations resulted in some limitations on that. Um, I think he'd have his signatures in and be, and be well on his way uh, if not for that. So uh, it's going to be, as we get into the summer and see that opening up, he's got the advantage. Um, I mean, pe- people who are running in the primary basically are, are off on a 90 day sprint. The people who are coming in as petition candidates, uh, and that's one of the things that's interesting about Landfield coming in as a petition candidate. The people that are coming in as petition candidates have a have a longer run at it, have more opportunity to to get to know their uh, to to walk the streets and to get to know their neighborhood. So um, I think I think there's an advantage there for Ed having running as a running as a petition candidate. Uh, he needs to connect with the legis- with the constituency anyway to get the signatures. And um, and I, yeah, I think he's got a certainly has a has a fair chance there uh the senate flipping over to the senate the senate's interesting i'm not sure there are well there aren't as many senate seats up and i'm not sure there are as many uh uh, we're going to find as many key uh races one certainly is going to be um john coghill's seat Uh, rob myers uh is the is a republican challenger uh in that seat and uh and i think we'll give uh, John a run for his money. John certainly is out in front in terms of uh, in terms of financing right now. He's got nineteen thousand uh, uh, dollars in the bank roughly. Uh, Rob's just really sort of getting underway, raising money, and uh, and that's going to be a ninety day sprint. Yeah, no, there is some interesting. I see David Wilson is kind of embattled, although really to his advantage, there are five Republican candidates. Uh, and two independents running uh, for his seat, um, and so it's uh, it's interesting to see that there's some dis uh, you know some d- dissatisfaction in that area. But again, too many too many to call at this point. Uh, the Jeff Landfield, as you said, I, that's going to be just a popcorn. You're just going to pop the popcorn and watch, sit back and watch as he kind of goes and makes. Uh, uh, Jeff has a tendency to kind of make make farce of everything that's going on. Stephen Duplantis is the only solid uh, candidate in there, I think, on the Republican side. But even he has uh, he's run off the reservation. I've seen some of his Facebook posts lately, and I'm I, you know starting to ask questions like, well, can we get a more solid candidate in there at this point? Um, it's it's pretty crazy. Um, but also Kathy Geisel's district, she's got a pretty solid. Um, uh, uh, a slate uh, running as well. She does. Uh, Roger Holland uh, has uh, has shown. I mean, he's he's showing that he's raised twelve thousand dollars as of the last filing date, financial filing date. Uh, but Geisel has uh, forty nine thousand dollars, so it's uh, well forty three thousand dollars if you take out expenses. So you've got uh, you've got uh, uh, that, and then whoever comes out of that primary, and and Holland. Uh, uh, stands a chance in that primary. Whoever comes out of that primary uh, is going to have uh, uh, Care Clift, who's a libertarian. Uh, uh, I, don't, I don't think she's running as an L, but I, I think she's running as a petition candidate. But you'll have Care uh, in the general, and you're going to have uh, a D in that in the general. So um, not a well-known D, but you're going to have a D in the general. So it's going right. to be a it's, it's going to be an interesting uh, an, an interesting race. Also, I I think Michael, I think the sum of it is that you can see a path uh, in both the House and the Senate to a more conservative leadership. I, I, I think you can see a path to having enough people to tilt the balance, to have a, to have a more conservative caucus in the House and a more conservative caucus um, uh, in the Senate. Uh, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to depend on the outcome of, of two, three, four key races in the House and a couple of key races in the Senate, because the Senate's so tight, maybe three key races in the Senate uh, to get there. But, but I mean, the good news is you can see a path 
the 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 challenging news is whether that path is is going to become realistic. I gotta say, just for personal um, just for personal uh, uh, pleasure, I see a lot of names on these lists that were that I see in the chat room quite frequently. Uh, here on the program. So hopefully some of those folks out there are listening. Uh, we see a lot of names. Willie Keppel uh, from District 38 is out there. Of course, we've got our own Harold Borbridge uh, running uh, as well against Kathy Giesel and, of course, Ron Gillum uh, and Ed King and there, and Kevin McKinley. There's a lot of folks who are listening and talking with us on this program uh, on a weekly basis that are out there. So I hope folks who are in these various districts are paying attention and listening and, and hopefully um, we'll uh, we'll join on board with some of these candidates and and really push for some of this stuff because we we need to make a change there's no doubt about it this is if, if anything is going to change what's you know number one thing on the charter of changes is changing the players and this is where we've got to get to right yep yeah, absolutely right uh, I, I'm sure Harold's going crazy in the in the chat room correcting that it, he's running against josh reback not against uh kathy but. oh that's sorry that's right josh Re- i apologize uh, against uh, josh reback no, min- but we got lynn gaddis on there too who's yep. running in uh, house district seven uh to to come back into that seat there's opposite there's you know two other republicans in that primary but yeah there's there's uh some really strong candidates uh that i think would make uh w- w- would help remake uh, the structure of uh, of both bodies into into a more conservative and more effective uh, body. You know, it, I, I'm going to come back to one other thing though. The governor needs to get involved. Uh, if the governor wants a legislature that's responsive to him, the governor needs to get out there and say, "Look, these are candidates that that are going to back me up uh, in districts, especially in districts where the governor's strong." Yep. I'm not sure it would do any good in Juno, but but you know, in the Valley races or or other races and the Kenai races, I think the governor needs to step up and say, These are candidates who would help me out, help us achieve the agenda I I outlined at the beginning. So that's 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 a factor that, that we haven't seen come come into play here. Uh, but one, hopefully, that, that, that we will see as, uh, as these races develop. Let me see if there's any questions for Brad. I'm sure Harold was screaming at me because I said uh, he was running against Kathy Giesel instead of Josh Revac. My bad. Too many names on the screen all at once. Um, Ed is young and in a Democratic, he- Democratic heavy Juno. His campaign is going to get squished like a tomato at a bad theater show, says Harold. Well, we'll see. Um <laughs> some some say the same about Harold Drake. Yeah, I, well, that's true. I mean, I mean, things could be thrown around as he. Uh, what about uh, District Four? Says Aaron. District Four is uh, Grier Hopkins against Keith Kerber, and I've never, I don't know who Keith Kerber is. Um, Hopkins is a known name in the Fairbanks area. Um, I really don't know anything about Kerber. Um, interestingly enough, in House District Two. I know both Steve Thompson and Dave Sell. Uh, I worked for Steve Thompson for many years when he owned the auto parts store there. Uh, and I've known Dave for a long time uh, as well, David Sell. I didn't even know he was thinking about running. Uh, it'll be interesting. He's got no political experience that I'm aware of, uh, but he is a good guy and uh, I think a, a, a smart cookie. So uh, I would. I'm glad that somebody... Uh, was running against Steve in the primary because he needs a challenger. He needs a, he needs some change. You know the really interesting thing about that race, and this this may be a glitch in the uh, in the spreadsheet so far, but the really interesting thing in that race is Steve is showing no money. Um, right. It, and surely he has some, but but if he if he doesn't have a significant amount, that's a that's an interesting uh, interesting development in that race because most of the others. Most of the other uh, uh, incumbents uh, are showing uh, are showing some money. I mean, Bart showing Bart Lebon showing sixteen thousand, uh, Grier showing you know sixty six hundred uh, or five thousand after you take out expenses. Um, uh, but but Steve's not showing any money. So that's that's I mean maybe the, maybe there's something going on in that district. Right, right. No, and like I said, the Kevin McKinley race, like you said, was going to be interesting because right now he's got uh, ten thousand, almost eleven thousand dollars cash on hand versus Adam Wool's four thousand, which uh, again in a district that can flip flop back and forth, money may be the tell in that race when it's all said and done, uh, depending on on who's uh, on on who who goes through. You know that may be an energy level case. That, that usually that sort of, in, in the case of an incumbent, that sort of low fundraising level means that they're sort of getting tired, 
and they're not they're not putting in the work. They're sort of sort of running on running on their reputation or running on fumes. The fact that Kevin's got that money, uh, at least according to this chart, he's got that money. Uh, I think it's an indicator indication that he's got energy, um, and that uh, that can be a tipping point in these races. A candidate who's you get a you get a you get a district that goes back and forth. Uh, you get a candidate who's energetic against an incumbent who's sort of who's a little bit tired, uh, and you begin to you know you can see movement, you can see change in that in that in a district like that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, any any thoughts on House District 15 and the whole Gabrielle Ledoux Dave Nelson thing? Any any thoughts on that right now? I have not uh, delved into to Dave Nelson. I I don't have a, a good feel for his background. Um, Gabby, as always, uh, has has a war chest. I mean, she has what forty three thousand dollars or so uh, that she's raised and ready to go. I mean, she does have a whole lot of personal issues, um, but you know, money uh, money makes a difference sometimes, and uh, and that's a lot of money. I I. Um, I, I will. I will uh, spend time uh, uh, learning more about Dave Nelson as the can, as the campaign develops. Now that these fields have sort of solidified, uh, but um, but no, I don't. I don't have a good feel for that right now. All right, Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. If you have a question or a comment for Brad, now's the time to throw that out there. Here, we're going to uh, jump into number two here when we get back, which is the. Uh, uh, pricing on oil, which seems to have uh, stabilized and start to come back a bit. Uh, Brad's going to kind of go over uh, that, and then where does it take us uh, here on the program? But this is kind of the exciting start to the uh, to the real 2020 election season. And as we said, number one on the charter of changes is changing the players. If we don't do this, um, really nothing else matters. I mean, well, I mean, it all matters. Don't get me wrong. But this is the first and biggest and most important change right out of the gate. Uh, it's the one that's reachable. Um, I would say that as far as priorities go, the number two change would actually be three, which is changing the rules. If we can eliminate the binding caucus, uh, which I think we may have a shot at uh, as Mike Shower continues to get his uh, finish his uh, his project here as far as research across the country, we've got a good opportunity to make uh, to make some changes here. Uh, and I'm kind of excited to see what's uh, what's going on with that. Now we're moving on to uh, number two, which is all about oil and gas prices. The prices are more stabilized, Brad. Give us some details as to uh, uh, what you're seeing and what does it mean for us here in the state of Alaska? Well, there's some good news, Michael. Uh, in in April and uh, certainly in April and continue into May, uh, we talked a lot about uh, ANS uh, Alaska North Slope Oil having become disconnected from Brent um, and selling at a significant discount uh, to Brent. April, in particular, uh, was a, was was problematic in that regard. I mean, Brent never went below zero. Uh, uh, ANS did. Um, and the differential for the month uh, was between the two was about uh, eleven dollars a barrel. Brent sold at eleven dollars a barrel, higher than uh, higher than A and S. Um, and and it, as as we discussed on the show before, A and S has historically been tied to Brent, so that was a a big shock and 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 frankly, from a revenue standpoint, a problem. That differential closed um, in uh, in May. Uh, now that May's over, we can run the averages or run the numbers, and uh, ANS closed within four dollars on average average price uh, uh, during May. Uh, the the and, and so that's that's good. And now that we get into now that we get into June, ANS is actually selling uh, at a at a at a small premium uh, to Brent. Uh, not only has ANS recovered. Uh, the differential, but it's uh, but it's selling at a at a small pre premium. So, the 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 disconnect of Brent that, that really bothered me a lot in April uh, and and in May has sort of dissipated, and we're now back to sort of the historical relationship between ANS and Brent, uh, and that's a good thing. the The downside of it is is what are we back to? Well, we're back to thirty dollars. We're back to the thirty thirty dollar range. I mean. ANS is is running in the high 30s right now, uh, heading toward 40. But I, most analysts expect uh, uh, the the that exuberance in price to sort of settle down, uh, and for us to stay in the 30s uh, for an extended period of time. The 
the futures market is saying that we stay in the 30s uh, at least through the end of the year. And and if we cross into the 40s, it'll be uh, be the low 40s. Um, and that is the estimate. That's that's really the frankly the the projection that the uh, uh, Department of Revenue had in their spring revenue forecast that we would be in that shape um, uh, when they made that when they made that forecast in March. We're sort of back to that uh, forecast, and that forecast is the one that gives us a billion and a half dollars, billion eight hundred million dollar deficits uh, going forward. So the good news is we've recovered back against Brent. We're now ANS is back in a in a in a good relationship with Brent. The bad news is. That uh, that Brent Brent I itself now is uh, is in the thirty to thirty dollar range, and that's uh, that's not going to paper over the the problems we've uh, we've got in the state. One other side note, and and hopefully this is temporary, but part of the reason ANS is recovering, uh, frankly, is because ANS has become more scarce on the West Coast. Conoco has reduced uh, its uh, production for June. Uh, and is giving no indication that it's going to change that, has reduced its production for June by 100,000 barrels a day, which frankly is huge. It's 20% of, uh, of ANS throughput, TAPS throughput. So production levels in June are going to be 20% below uh, uh, the the normally expected uh, 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 300,000 or 500,000 uh, mark. Uh, they're going to be instead in the low 400,000s, uh, high 300. Uh, thousands where they're currently running now. Uh, and that means even though we have price recovery uh, in June, revenues are going to be down because uh, because volumes are going to be down. So uh, the ANS recovery is good. Uh, coming back into the relationship with Brent is very good. Um, the the fact that but the fact is that 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 the price levels that we're looking at still produce huge deficits for the state billion and a half plus deficits for the state. Um, and we're going to have this temporary situation where volumes, even though prices up, volumes are down uh, at least through June. And uh, and that's going to be rough from a revenue standpoint as well. So this is more of a good news, bad news kind of situation. I mean, the good news is ANS seems to be recoupled to Brent. The bad news is it still leaves us with a almost $2 billion deficit running forward with no answers as to how uh, we're going to uh, fix that coming from uh, really anybody right now. So that's uh, definitely definitely not the rosy side on the horizon that we were looking for. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, it, it's, uh, it, it's the cavalry's not come over the hill. Neither the, neither the oil price cavalry nor, nor the production cavalry uh, is coming over the hill. In fact, the production cavalry is sort of going into a soft retreat uh, for the moment. So candidates are still going to have to step up and say how they're going to close this billion and a half plus uh, plus fiscal gaps out there. They can't. Right. No, no one can look at this price chart and say we're going to paper over it with uh, uh, we're going to paper over it with price recovery. Right. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Hey, look, it looks like we may have gotten enough room to get into number three today, Brad. It's a miracle. It's a Christmas and June miracle. Um, <laughs> let's uh, move on to number three, which has to do with COVID and the next round of COVID stimulus. I mean, because, you know, hey, we're going we're gonna to make money up out of thin air. We might as well get some of it, right? How does Alaska fare in the next uh, COVID monetary question? Well, there's been a lot of discussion about, about Congress passing another Recovery Act. The Republicans in the Senate initially resisted it. Now they're talking about it. And and one of the themes uh, in the recovery uh, as part of the next Recovery Act is another chunk of money coming uh, coming to the states. Uh, the, the HEROES Act bill that the House passed uh, that was dead on arrival in the Senate had a billion, had a trillion dollars, excuse me, I get confused when I go between Alaska and federal, but had a trillion dollars uh, uh, for uh, for state and local government. Uh, the Republicans really have have announced that that amount is dead on arrival, but they're they're talking about a half trillion dollars, five hundred billion dollars going to the states. The, the The question is how that gets allocated out to the states, and and the focus, of course, is going to be on the states worst hit uh, by by COVID. Interestingly, Moody's, uh, the rating agency, uh, analytics put out the analytics part of the of, of Moody's, put out a, a, an analysis last week of which states have been worst hit by COVID. COVID from a from a, a state revenue standpoint, 
Um, and there are three states that stand out as not hit very hard uh, and, and, and as being in decent shape. Um, Alaska is one of the three states uh, on the Moody's chart. It's Alaska, Wyoming, and New Mexico for some reason. Um, and the reason is that Alaska, the reason is because we have counted and we've told Moody's to count and we've told the world to count uh, uh, PFD revenues as state revenues. Right. So Moody's takes that at face value and says, well, Alaska's not in, in very bad shape. If you if you convert all of the PFD to uh, to state revenues, yes, we still have a deficit, but it's a relatively small deficit. Right. Right. If you convert it. If you don't, we're in deep trouble. <laughs> but exactly right. But that's what we've told the rating agencies to do. We've told them to make that conversion. And so when when Congress is going to look at things like Moody's and they'll look at Moody's uh, as as an analysis of what states are in trouble, Alaska will not show up uh, as being a state in trouble because of because of the conversion of, of, of PFD revenues uh, uh, to state revenues. I, I this is one of the issues that I've had with the Dunleavy administration, why they didn't start changing the rhetoric uh, yep. on about yep. that. But but they haven't. Yeah, no, I mean, this is a problem of their own making. This just is like, uh, you know, to add insult to injury, not only did they take the PFDs from Alaskans, convert it to state revenue, now it's going to come back and bite us in the butt on top of all this other stuff and just create even more problems down the road because it makes it look like we are less worse than we actually are. Yeah, it's it's an amazing, I mean, it's an amazing chart. I posted it last week. I'll post it again uh, for people who uh, who are interested. It shows... You know, shows North Dakota as a as 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 a state that's that's hurting somewhat. Iowa is a state that's hurting somewhat. California is a state uh, that's hurting somewhat. You go to the East Coast and you find states that are that are that are hurting more. But Alaska stands out as as one of those states that uh, you know it, it, it. Moody's Moody's sort of portrayed it as a poster child of a very well prepared state, uh, a state that was very well prepared for. Uh, for uh, for you know a challenge uh, uh, that the that the that COVID has uh, that the pandemic has has brought about, um, and so they sort of you, you know they 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 list Alaska as as one of the states that really was forward thinking about how to prepare for this stuff, and and it's it's entirely because they're converting the PFD to state revenues, right? Which is again just crazy in the long run. Uh, and Michael Beck says, and there you have it, why the legislature does give us our money to keep our credit rating up so they can borrow more in our name in the future, <laughs> which is, oh, man, this whole thing is just such a poo parade. Uh, I don't even know what to do. Uh, Brad, you know, I, I think you and I talked a little bit last week about uh, potentially um, – uh, uh, putting together a candidates forum, and I know we didn't talk about it this week, but I think we should talk about it uh, uh, last week. We didn't talk about it. I think we should talk about it this week or next, and maybe we should put together something, even if it's virtually, uh, to be able to sit down and have a Zoom meeting or something with a bunch of candidates and and ask some questions. I think it would be a valid and a valuable resource for people who are trying to make their decisions out there. So let's, uh, you and I, let's carve some time out and do that this week and maybe we can come up with something. So Michael, that sounds like a great, great suggestion. I, I, I jotted down a couple of, uh, well, five questions that, uh, we could talk about as a, as a beginning format for that. So good. I, I'm in for it. Okay, good. Well, we'll uh, we'll continue this and we'll put it together. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. You could find him at ak4sb.com or on the web on uh, Facebook. Uh, links are at the top of the video right now. If you're watching the video, there's links to his Facebook page. And, of course, you post all the time. You, the Brad posts. My, my notifications go off all the time. Brad's always got something interesting to uh, throw out there. Brad Keithley, thank you so much, my friend. I appreciate it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.